alaikum and um, hello, welcome, I guess, to all of you, all of my students. So we meet again, although we meet online, but still, I hope you still remember my face, okay? And um, I'm hoping that all of you are doing well inside your home. Stay safe, okay? Um, don't go outside, okay? So we're doing our classes online. And um, I hope that all of you will go through the videos and also the assignments that I'm going to give you. So from there, we're able to cover what we need to cover within our syllabus. All right. So, um, yeah, without wasting any more time, let's go into our first, not our first, um, chapter four, basically where we left off from before. So chapter four will be on graphics. Okay. Um, now just a little quick recap if all of you remember there are five elements of multimedia okay can you name yourself so the first one we have would be text so we have covered that before so today we're going into graphics okay then we also have sound we have video and also animation so any combination of these elements will make up multimedia as we all know multi is multiple media is some sort of a medium that we you know we need to sort of um, convey our messages all right so um yeah we're going into chapter four so this will be on graphics okay so what exactly are graphics so if i ask you what are graphics of course you would say kind of related to images or pictures photographs Okay, anything of that sort. Basically, graphics are, it relates with the aesthetic aspect of your project. You know, basically what you see, okay, what you see in front of you, whether it's attractive or not attractive, right? So those are graphics, okay? Now, creation of multimedia images. So before you start any kind of project, um, the first thing that you need to do is plan your approach. So whenever we do any kind of images or designing any kind of graphics, of course, we start with a blank canvas, just a blank canvas paper, basically. So how do you plan to do your graphics? It's either, okay, you can actually outline your project and graphic ideas through a sketch, or if it's just within your brain, or you take some inspirations from different projects, okay? So you need to plan your approach. How are we going to do this? Okay. And then once you know what to do, okay, you kind of have a rough idea what kind of graphics that you want to design. Next thing is to organize your tools. So let's say, you know, you're trying to do a poster. All right. So what kind of tools that you might need? Of course, as we all know, when it comes to graphics, you could use Photoshop or you could use Illustrator. And there are many other tools that you can use as well. So the content of it okay are you going to import it or are you going to create it yourself so you need to plan the elements that are inside there okay if possible use multiple monitors um, I don't know if you have seen this but um, in certain offices or on certain um, you know people's workstation you might find um, people set up multiple monitors why is that because you know, instead of, you know, sometimes when we have a project, we tend to um, open up many applications at the same time. So if you have multiple monitors, you're able to open up different application on different monitors. So you don't have to actually minimize and maximize the same thing over and over again. So that saves time and saves effort as well. Okay. All right. So creation of still images. Now, still images or graphics are considered as the most important element in a multimedia project. Why do you think that is? Have you ever seen a project where none of them have used graphics? I don't think that you can find a project where there isn't any images used at all. Why? Why do people use graphics? Why are people attracted to Instagram? Okay. If you notice nowadays, people go on Instagram instead of Twitter. Okay, Twitter. <laughs> Why is that? Because Twitter is text-based, right? Whereas Instagram is image-based. So we tend to be more attracted to things that we see. Okay. So the reason why 
images are considered to be the most important element is because it deals with the aesthetic of your project. So if it is attractive, then people are of course attracted to your project. All right. All right, so still images are generated based on the display resolution, hardware and software capability. So depending on what kind of tools that you have, the outcome of your graphics will be a little bit different. For example, if you have a drawing tablet, then it might, you know, the outcome of your project would be somewhat a little bit better than, you know, the people who just use mouse to draw. Okay, so depending on the tools that you use, the outcome of your project might be a little bit different. Okay. So when we talk about graphics, all right, there are two main types of graphics. We have bitmaps and we also have vector. Okay, I'm gonna talk um, a little bit more in details um, of each type. All right, so this first type of graphics that we're gonna be talking about is bitmaps. Okay, it says here that bitmaps is also known as paint graphics. Now, like I've mentioned earlier, there are two types of graphics. Can you name them? Okay, first one we have is bitmap and the other one would be vector, okay? Bitmap is known as paint graphics, whereas vector is known as a drawn graphics. Paint and draw. Now, can you see the difference? Imagine you're an artist and you have a piece of paper. What you're drawing is actually a picture, right? So that is a graphic, okay? So your picture, you know, when you're an artist, you can either draw or you can color okay so if you're drawing what you're doing is you're drawing it line by line right okay if you're coloring what you're doing is you're using colors okay you're painting you're painting on the colors on your picture okay so when we talk about bitmap okay bitmap is a paint graphic meaning that the picture will consist of colors Okay, so bitmap derived from the words bit and also map. Okay, bit, of course, it means zero or ones, and map is actually is mapping the bits of your pictures. Okay, by definition, bitmaps is a data matrix that describes tiny individual dots that form an image which is displayed on a computer screen or printed. Okay, basically, bitmaps. Okay, like I said, bitmap is a picture, right? Okay. The picture will consist of this tiny, 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 tiny individual dots that makes up your picture. Okay, so this tiny individual individual dots is called pixels. Now, imagine you have a picture. Okay, so let's say I'm drawing a a tree. Okay, let's say that this is a tree. Now, for Whenever you have this image, every single thing that you see on your image will consist of a pixel. This is a pixel, this is a pixel. Each of the things that you see on your image there is a pixel. Okay, so a pixel, what does it contain? A pixel will contain colors. Now this is why we call it bitmap because bitmap is a data matrix that contains the color data okay so for example let's say that we say this particular image has a bit depth of one bit okay so if this particular image is one bit meaning that the number of colors that are possible to be included inside this image are two now how do i know that because 2 to the power of n, okay? The n is a number of bits, okay, the bit depth, all right? So if I say the image is one bit depth, meaning that it is 2 to the power of 1. So there are two number of colors possible that can be displayed on the image, okay? So if I say this image is 4 bit depth, meaning that 2 to the power of 4. So on this image, there can be 16 possible colors that will be displayed on that image. Understood? Okay. So if I show you this, okay, we have these two sets of images. The first um, type of image we have is a colored image at the top here. And at the bottom, we call it as a grayscale image. Okay. 
a colored image meaning that there are you know possible colors other than just black white or gray okay so that's what we call a colored image so if a colored image has a four bit depth meaning that this particular image has 16 colors that's why a four bit depth has a lower resolution than a 24 bit depth image okay a four bit depth image 2 to the power of 4 meaning that this image can only display 16 colors okay so the image produced won't be that pretty okay the resolution will be lower okay whereas this image okay is 2 to the power of 24 so 2 to the power of 24 will contain millions of colors that's why this image is a lot better because it can display a lot more colors and making the image looks a lot more higher quality okay if you take a look at the bottom that it is called a grayscale image okay why is it called grayscale because one image can contain many many different shades of grays okay it is not black and white grayscale okay grayscale meaning that there are many shades of gray that can be produced within that picture okay so if you have a four bit grayscale okay it has a lower resolution than eight bit grayscale because four bit grayscale can contain 16 shades of gray whereas eight bit grayscale can contain 256 shades of gray which has a higher resolution okay a monochrome image on the other hand has one bit depth so to the power of one so to the power of one there are only two possible colors that can be displayed on the image so it's either black or white simple as that so this is called a monochrome image okay now bitmaps are an image format that is suitable for creating photorealistic images complex drawings images that require fine detail so if i ask you let's say i take a picture let's say i'm outside and i look at a sunset and i, I find it very pretty okay and i want to take a picture of it is that picture a bitmap yes why because whenever we take a picture okay every single thing that we see will consist of colors so how do we see how does the camera capture what we see it actually captures colors so every single thing every single image that we take using a camera will consist of pixels and each pixel will contain the colors that we see all right so of course bitmaps um, can be used for photorealistic image anything any drawing that complex and any image that you know we might need finer details okay um, bitmaps can be inserted into your multimedia project by using this method okay i'll go through each one now i'm sure all of you heard of clip art galleries okay you can find this in most software okay especially when it comes to like microsoft software things like um powerpoint things like microsoft word so instead of you creating the images from scratch okay you can use a clip art gallery and retrieve or copy and paste the images that you find attractive that or that you want to use okay so clip art gallery contains an assortment of graphics photographs sound and video and it allows you to use any clip arts that are inside it inside your project okay so clip art basically is an alternative for users who do not want to create their own image so this is the most easiest way i'm sure you have used this in your primary school when you were younger right okay so um other than this okay instead of using clip art galleries okay you can use google you can search for images from google okay so when you search for images on the internet Okay, you need to keep in mind of the legal rights of those images. Okay, for every existing images, there are legal rights protecting the use of those image. I don't know if you've heard of copyright. Okay, this is a serious matter because if you don't follow the legal rights that are protecting those image, you can be sued. All right. Um, now, uh, there are three types of images. Um, that you may find over the internet okay so keep in mind of these three types so the first one is public domain images these images are either never protected by copyright or their copyright protection has ended so let's say um okay let's say you want to do a blog all right you want to do a website okay um and you want to use a picture of a cat right so you type um in google so you write cat 
okay so the pictures that you use you need to keep in mind whether it's a public domain image or not if it's a public domain you can use it without worrying that you could be sued okay with this type of image the person that took that picture or created that picture either never protected it or the copyright protection has ended meaning the license okay so you can use it without any worry okay the second type of image is a royalty free image these images can be purchased and then used without paying additional license fees so sometimes if you notice that websites like shutterstock okay so um the images that you want to use inside shutterstock you will find that they have like watermark okay and in order for you to use it you know in, in very good quality and remove that watermark you need to purchase it okay so the stock footage house or websites will provide you with many 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 images that you can use by purchasing it because um, the people that uh, place the images inside this websites are usually um, you know professional photographers and you know um, you know they they need to make a living right so as photographers okay um, they will put the images that they created and you can actually use them and buy them okay those are called royalty free images Okay, the third type of image is called the rights managed images. So these images requires you to negotiate with the rights holder regarding the terms and price for using the image. Now, this is a little bit different than a royalty free image. Royalty free image, you can purchase it one time without paying additional fees. So once you've purchased it, you can just completely use it, right? With right managed images, you need to somehow negotiate with the right holder in terms of the price or in terms of you know how long you're going to use it all right so let's say i want to use this particular image and the creator said that okay you can use this image for three months after three months it is no longer yours so you need to somehow negotiate in terms of the price and things like that okay so that is the difference between royalty free image and rights managed images so like i said okay when we're creating bitmaps okay the software that you can use to do that is adobe photoshop you can also create some bitmaps inside illustrator as well okay um another brand or another company that created that that you know you can use um software other than adobe is called coral so they have corals painter and coral draw all right like i've said earlier images can either be created from scratch or you can take it from other sources, you know, such as Google, etc. But sometimes you can actually capture some images that you see on the screen. For example, if I like a particular image that I see on this screen right now, okay, and I want to capture what I see, I can use screen capture. Okay, so what you can do is you can just click on your keyboard, you have print screen, or you can use um, a software, a particular software called Snipping Tool, which makes things a lot easier to screen capture things, okay? Screen capture your graphics, to be exact, all right? So once you have screen capture things, or you find images that you like, what you do to insert it inside your project, you would use copy and paste. Now, this is a method of copying a particular image and actually pasting it inside your software or your project all right so what happens with copy and paste okay we use a thing called a clipboard imagine a clipboard is just a board an empty board so when you like a particular picture you copy this image and you paste it on your clipboard so you click on ctrl c right which is copy and you paste it on your clipboard so now your clipboard has image on it okay before it was empty when you click ctrl c it now has an image on the clipboard so whenever you're ready to pay to paste your image you can just click on ctrl v and paste it on your project so that's how clipboard works and um, sometimes when you close off any software you notice that do you want to clear your clipboard i'm sure some of you have seen that before right okay so when you see that it means that it wants to clear the clipboard so when you click on yes, whatever that you've copied onto your clipboard, you can't paste it anymore because you have cleared it. All right. 
So, in order for copy and paste to work, you need a clipboard and of course you need to copy things first before you can paste it onto your project. Okay, once you have your images, okay, what you can do is you can use image editing software to edit your images. Okay, so what you can do is you can enhance your image. Let's say you have a dark pictures, you want to lighten them, okay. Uh, play with the contrast, okay, make it a bit warmer, make it a bit cooler toned. You know, it's up to you how you want to enhance your image. And you can even do composite image. If you see here, this is known as a composite image. Composite image is when we take different pictures and we create one picture that composites of you know these different images. So if you take a look here, we have this object, okay, you have this lady trying to, I don't know, somehow um who are i don't know what, what is she doing though <laughs> okay so i have these two objects right here so you can actually paste it on a park like a different background so this is called a composite image okay another thing that you can do is you can alter or distort your image so for example the original image is like this okay you can make it a bit smaller okay by changing the proportion and you can even alter the colors as well by using that image editing software Okay. Another thing that you can do is you can add and delete elements inside your graphics. So let's say I don't want these flowers right here, I can just remove them or you can add some other elements inside your graphics. So all of these are possible with image editing software. Now, morphing is another technique um, of using images and actually creating an animation out of it. Okay. So how it works is that it will take this different image and it will morph. What morph means, it will actually somehow smoothly blend and melt the pictures as it progresses into another. So if you take a look here, okay, this is a picture of Katy Perry and Tom Hiddleston. Um, it uses morphing. It shows that, um, you know, by morphing from one image to another, you can kind of see that Katy Perry somehow looks a bit like Tom Hiddleston, right? So it will point these different um, features um, that, you know, the image has. So this nose will reflect onto the other person's nose. So when they morph, it will somehow melt into the other image very seamlessly, okay? Um, yeah, if you take a look here, this is another example. We have Michael Jackson before and after, all right? And this is also some other examples as well. So we have all these different kids. Okay, they're actually all different kids. So you can use morphing to show that, you know, kids, when you put them together, they kind of look alike. So you can use morphing for that. Now, another way for you to retrieve or get your image is by scanning them. So let's say you have a photograph that you like and you want to put it inside your project or your poster. All right, so you can scan them. Okay, any photograph, any hand-drawn art, any paintings. So in order for you to scan things, of course you would need a scanner, okay? Anything that we've scanned using a scanner will be digitized as bitmap, okay? So that picture, will consist of pixels colors okay so once you have this bitmap images then you can use image editing software to make any alterations that you want okay all right so um the next type of graphic that i want to talk about is vectors okay again i repeat there are two types of graphics we have bitmaps which we have covered earlier and now we're going to talk about vectors okay Vector, okay, by definition is actually a line, just a line that is described by the location of its two endpoints. So if you recall, I have taught you Illustrator before, right? So whenever you want to create a line, you would know that it has these two endpoints. So you have to point out where you want to create that line, okay? So in order to draw a vector, a Cartesian coordinates are used. So if you're working with a 2D space, you can either have, you can, when you're working with a 2D space, okay, um, your lines will be pointed in terms of x axis and y axis, okay? So, how high you wanna go, how low you wanna go, or how wide you wanna make it, things like that. So, if you're working with 3D space, you have another added axis, which is depth, okay? Which makes it a lot more realistic by creating depth onto that image, okay? 
Now, again, bitmap is a paint graphics. Vector is a drawn graphic. So when we talk about things that we draw, okay, imagine when you draw things, use pencils, right? So you're drawing lines, okay? So when you draw lines, right, it means that you're working with vectors, right? So vectors can be created using graphic shapes or lines, okay? That can be mathematically expressed in angles, coordinates, and distances. So whenever you create these lines, it can be mathematically expressed. So everything is drawn very quickly, all right? So to draw vector graphics, drawing software are used such as Adobe Illustrator and Corel Draw. So you can, you can actually create vectors inside Illustrator. Now, whenever you create vectors, the most um, visible things that you find is that no matter how small or how big you draw your vector, the image will never be pixelated, okay? It won't get ruined, okay? It'll always look good because it is mathematically expressed in terms of vectors. If we have bitmaps, okay? Let's say your bitmap is this small, okay? And you wanna make it larger, really big, okay? When you use bitmap, that image will be pixelated, okay? So when it is pixelated, your image will look really really ugly all right with vectors no matter how big you make it or how big you resize it the quality will always be the same because it is mathematically expressed in terms of lines and shapes you know what i mean okay so um uh, the extension of vectors is dot svg okay so let's say i want to draw a ball a football okay like you see on the screen here okay so in order to draw that vector we can use lines and shapes to draw that so let's say you have a circle there is a shape okay then you draw what is that a pentagon all right then you draw different lines so what you're doing is you're drawing vectors okay so this is how a vector image can be formed all right whereas a bitmap to draw that ball you would use pixels instead so each of the things that you see on the screen will be in colors right okay so vectors are used in the following areas you have completed aided design cat programs so if you notice that cat programs things like autocad are usually used by architects right um, because with architects you need to draw buildings so when they draw buildings it needs to be in detail okay everything is in 3d you can't use bitmaps for that okay they use vectors another um, um uh, area okay that uses vectors is print media okay graphic artists designing for the print media um if you use bitmap to print you can do that but like again there will be a problem where pixelation can occur so if you use vectors confirmed that your images will always be sharp okay without any pixelation okay 3d animation programs they use this vector because vectors can be in 3d whereas bitmap is flat because we have pixels everything is flat okay um yeah application requiring drawing of graphic shapes of course we can use vectors for that Okay, so these are the difference between vectors and bitmaps. If you take a look here, vector images cannot be used for photorealistic images because what we're doing is we're drawing it. Okay, it can do it can look a little bit cartoonish. Okay, so um, when you color it in, you can look a little bit cartoonish. If you compare it to bitmap, okay, since everything is in pixel, it looks a lot more detailed, so it looks more real. All right. Um, Another big difference that you can see here, bitmaps are not easily scalable and resizable, okay? So let's say you have this picture of a mountain, okay? This is a bitmap. So if you zoom in this mountain, you can see the mountain is actually made up of pixels. Each pixel contains different colors, okay, that makes up that image. So that's why when you enlarge a bitmap, you can see the little pixels. So this means this image is pixelated when it is zoomed in or resized bigger or smaller, all right? Whereas you have vectors, since it is made up of lines, okay, that 
uh, mathematically express no matter how big or how small you magnify it or you resize it it always is sharp okay whereas if you have a bitmap of course it can be pixelated okay so um, vector images require a plugin for web-based web -based display okay because SVG might need a plugin for that okay things like PNG JPEG okay those are all some examples of bitmaps and they don't need any kind of plugins for that okay vector images use less memory space and have smaller file size okay like I said okay since we're drawing it and we're not dealing with each pixels or what kind of colors it want to produce inside each pixels of course it will have less memory space and a smaller file size in compared to bitmap where each pixel will have a data of what kind of color you want to produce so of course with bitmaps the image will be it will have a bigger file size okay um when it comes to bitmaps you can actually convert it to a vector if you want to okay what you can do is you can use auto tracing so what it does is it will take that bitmap image and it will detect the lines that makes up the image so it can convert that into a vector image for you okay all right now we're talking about 3d drawing okay like i've said when it comes to images there are two types of image you can have 2d image and you can have 3d image okay 2d image is a flat image Whereas 3D, it will provide a lifelike substance and feel to the project. Why? Because we have the Z dimension, the depth of the object. Okay, everything will look, lot, look a lot more realistic. Okay? So we have um, a 3D scene. Can we talk about a 3D scene? A 3D scene will actually contain object. Like any rooms, look around your room, you will notice that that is a scene. Let's say I'm inside this room. Okay? Inside this scene right here, I have me one object and I have a chair at the back here that's another object okay a scene will contain many objects so each object that is inside the scene okay will contain elements that made up a structure for example this chair what kind of structure makes up its shape for example another example is myself okay how does this object looks like this what the hell am I talking about? <laughs> I mean, um, okay, let's have your person. How do you create the object? Okay, of course, it will have the elements that make up a structure. Okay, the more complicated a structure, the finer its resolution and smoothness. The more details that you put to draw your 3D model, okay, the higher the resolution, the more realistic that it will look. Okay, so these are the process of creating an object in a 3D space. Okay, when you have a 3D space, of course, like I've said, you have objects inside it, right? Okay, so each object that you have inside the scene, you need to model it. Why? Because we need to know how you're going to construct the shape of your object. Okay, so there are two ways for you to do this. Either you create a shape from scratch. Okay, maybe you could draw, let's say you want to draw this chap. Okay, what you can do is you can draw each line of that chair by yourself. Or you can use primitives. Primitives are existing shapes imported from a library of geometric shapes. You take a look at this chair, maybe this particular thing is called a block. Okay, you have one, two, three, four, another longer block. Okay, so four, I don't know how you're going to construct the shape. Okay, so you can use primitives for that to construct the object that you want to do. Okay, this is called modeling the object. So, another way for you to model your object is by using extrusion or lathing. Okay, extrusion and lathing are two techniques that you can use um, to convert a flat image to a 3D image. Okay, let's say you have um, a text, okay, a flat text that says Photoshop 3D something flat but how do you make it into 3d 3d is possible because of the depth right so what you can do is you can extrude the shape by extending the depth of your object you're extending the shape of a plane surface over some distance so for example this one you're creating depth by extending that shape so now it has become 3d instead of flat okay 
Another technique is called lathing. Okay, instead of extending the shape, which is called extrusion, lathing involves you rotating the profile of the shape around a defined axis. Let's say you have a flat image right here. In order to make it 3D, you can actually rotate that and mix it into a 3D shape. Okay, that's another technique that you can do. Okay, that's the difference between extrusion and lathing. Now, once you've modeled your objects, in order to make it more realistic, you can apply textures and colors. Okay, for example, I have modeled a table right here. To make it look a lot more realistic, I can put on some textures. Okay, making it making it has like a marble effect or something, which makes it a lot more shiny and things like that. Okay. Even on this example right here, okay, if you take a look here, without textures, it looks very plain. Once you've put on the textures, then the image looks a lot more realistic. Okay, you know now that this chest is wooded instead of just something that's very like blah, you know? <laughs> Alright, so once you have modeled all of your objects, everything is finished, you can place all of your objects into your 3D space. This is known as modeling your scene. Okay, so you place all of your objects inside your scene. Then what you can do is you can set up lights onto your objects to make it look more, you know, realistic. Okay, by providing flare or shadows. As we all know, okay, inside a scene, we have lights. So depending on where the lights are, okay, you can have shadows and you can have highlights. So if you take a look at, let's say for example, my face right here, I have highlights there and I have shadows. So these things make up, you know, a more realistic look, okay? So once everything is finished, you have modeled your object, you have modeled your scene, you can render your 3D drawing, okay? So rendering is actually a process of producing the final output, where the computer will use intricate algorithms to apply the effects that you have placed on the objects. Okay, so you have modeled everything, you have modeled your scene, you have modeled your objects, okay, and you want to make it into one seamless final output. So they will render, put everything that you have placed inside your scene, and they will put it and actually export it as a final output. The thing that is complete, lah, all right? Okay, so um, another type of image that we have is called a panoramic image, also known as panoramas. I'm sure, I am sure that all of you have heard this before, okay? Panoramic images are created by stitching together a sequence of photos around a circle and adjusting them into a single seamless bitmap, okay? So inside any camera, okay? Any camera nowadays, I think, have panoramic shot, okay? What you do is to create your panoramic shot, you will take your camera, okay? You will need to sort of move around your camera from one place to another. Because with panora panoramic image, okay, it will stitch, it will stitch or combine all these different images into one. So if you have a regular image, you just take one picture and that's that, right? Okay, a panora panoramic image, you will take, 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 and all these images that you take, it will combine into one seamless picture. Okay, I don't know if you guys have done this before. This is what you can do with a panoramic image. Let's say you have this person, like this one image, and you will see that the same object, let's say you have a friend. Okay, you can, inside that image, you can have your friend standing there, that, that, and also that. Okay, how you can do that is, Firstly, start with one location, tell your friend to go there. And then when you move your camera along, your friend needs to move as well. So as the camera takes pictures of each scene, the object will be there inside each scene. And that is possible with panoramic image because it's stitched together all those images into one seamless bitmap, right? Now, where do colors come from? Okay, like I've said, images have colors. Well, where does these colors come from though? Okay, even with our eyes, the things that we see are colors. If you take a look at my shawl right here, it's pink and my clothes is blue. Now, how do we see colors? Okay, we see colors because of 
light. Without light, if I close all of the lights, I can't see anything. So there's no colors involved. All right. So we know that colors actually comes from light. Okay. Light comes from an atom where an electron passes from a higher to a lower energy level. Each atom produces uniquely specific colors. Every surfaces will have different densities. As atoms touches or hits the surface, it will bounce back. Okay, so what is bounce back will be the reflection of a colored surface. Okay, and that is how we see colors, right? So color is the frequency of a light wave within the narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum to which the human eye responds. So how our eye responds to the frequency of the light wave is actually the colors that we see. Okay, so whatever light that is reflected back into our eyes, it is what colors that we see. All right. Now, the two most important color model that you need to know are called additive color and subtractive color. Okay, it is a complete opposite of one another. Again, I repeat, the two color models that you need to know are called additive color and subtractive color. Additive, subtractive. So what are the difference between the two? Now, additive color are colors that are created by combining colored light sources in three primary colors. When we talk about additive color, we're talking about these three colors in particular. Red, green, and blue. Okay? Why do we call it additive color though? Okay, if you take a look at the um, definition, a color is created by combining. A combining means that we're adding different things, right? We combine. So what are we combining? We're combining colored light sources. Like I said, there are only three light sources that are available, which are red, green, and blue. So by combining these light sources, we are able to produce many, 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 many different colors just from these three colors alone. Okay, so this type of color model are used by TVs, computer monitors, your mobile phones, okay, any screens that you see. Why? Because TVs, it uses light sources. I don't know if you know this, okay, but it has light, right? So if you don't have power, then there's no light. That's why your screen is black, right? Meaning there's no light. Okay, again, your phone, if you close your phone, the screen becomes black, right? Because there's no light. Okay, so you know that the light sources are in these three colors, red, green, and blue. And how do we see all these different colors on your phones, on your screen, on your TVs? It's because from these three colors, we're able to combine them and make other colors as well, okay? So within the TVs, within the computer monitors, there are dot pictures which is arranged in triads of red, green, and blue. Okay, inside your TVs and stuff, you have this red light, this blue light, and green light. So when these colors are lit up, okay, and they are combined, you can create other colors as well. Okay, it says here it starts with black, okay, meaning that your screen is pitch black, no light. So, when we add different lights, then that's when we see colors on our screen, okay? So, when we mix all of the lights together, maximum number of red, maximum number of blue, maximum number of green. So, a lot of lights, right? So, suddenly, when you combine all of those colors together in maximum amount, it will create a white light, okay? That's how we see the white inside, I mean, on our screen. Now, another color model is called a subtractive color, okay? Subtractive color are colors that are created by combining colored media such as paint or ink that absorb some part of color spectrum of light and reflect the other back to the eye, okay? Now, earlier we talked about additive, so meaning that we combine the light sources. Now, don't think about the light sources on screen because things like printing, Okay, when we print, we don't use light, right? 
Okay, we use ink. Okay, so these are colored media. So what we do is we take this ink, okay, and we combine those ink colors. So what ink colors that we have? Okay, when we have subtractive color, we have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. That is why when you buy ink printers, okay, the ink for your printers, okay, you will notice that it has only these four colors. You have cyan, you have magenta, you have yellow, and also a separate color called black. Okay, if you want to print colors, you would use cyan, magenta, yellow, and black will kind of, I guess, create the depth, I mean, the darkness of your um, colors. All right, so this ink, when we combine them, we can create other colors as well. How it works is that why is it called subtractive color? Okay, so let's say we have a piece of paper, okay, and we only have um, the ink cyan on that paper. How do we see cyan on that paper? It's because we have these natural light sources, okay, and our eyes it will respond to whatever that is reflected back to the eye, right? Okay, so let's say you have cyan on your paper right here okay so when the light hits that ink okay the other colors will be subtracted or absorbed and the only thing that is reflected back to our eye is the cyan color you get what i mean okay so let's say if we combine um uh okay let's see if we combine cyan and um, magenta for example okay then we produce another color so how do we see that color because all the other um, colors will be absorbed or subtracted okay and the color and the things that we see is that particular color you get what i mean okay so anything that we that is not a part of what we see will be subtracted or absorbed within that material. This is why we call it a subtractive color. So this method is used in printing, okay? So any combination of cyan, magenta, and yellow will create colored media, colored printing, okay? So the black, okay? The black ink that we use in printing will help create darkness for the colors. Okay? And also, if you combine cyan, magenta, and yellow, you can also create a black color. Although it's not super black, in order for you to get that really, really black, you need that darkness from the black ink. Okay? So, yeah, without any ink, okay, it's just a white light. So, that's why we see an empty paper. You get me? Right? Okay, so other than um, the additive and the subtractive color model that I've talked about, okay, additive is RGB, red, green, and blue. Subtractive is CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And we also have other models such as HSB and HSL model. We have, um, you know, CMYK, CIE, YIQ, YUV, YCC. So there are many, many, many color models that you can use within your project if you want okay so um, when it comes to um, color models such as rgb okay which is your additive color model okay in order to create a particular color each color that is combined will have its intensity okay so it can range from zero to two five five so let's say if you want to produce a red color so how much of the red light do we need of course 255 five, and green is zero blue is zero okay but if you want to use if you want to produce a yellow color maybe a mixture of some amount of red and some amount of green and zero blue okay if you want to produce a white light then 255 five for red 255 five for green 255 five for blue if you want to create a black color then zero for all of those colors okay all right so color palettes okay color palettes are mathematical tables that define the color of a pixel displayed on the screen okay so color palettes 
you know, are basically the colors that are available for you to use within your project. Okay, so if you choose a one bit color palette, meaning that the only color that are possible to be used are black and white because to the power of one, you can only use two colors, black and white. Okay, so if you use 24 bit um, color palette, two to the power of 24, meaning that there are millions of colors that can be used inside your image, all right? Okay, dithering, all right? Dithering is a process whereby the color value of each pixel is changed to the closest matching color values in the target palette. Meaning that, let's say you have a 16-bit um, colored image, okay? And you think that, oh, okay, I think that this image is a bit too big for my liking. It's a bit too large. I want to compress that image. So, when I compress certain things, I know that the quality of it will be reduced, okay? So... Meaning that when the quality is reduced or the bit depth is reduced, the less color that can be used within that image. So we can't use a particular color that we use in a 16-bit image in an 8-bit image. So in order to match um, to the closest matching color value, we use a process called dithering. So it is done using a mathematical algorithm. So it will somehow map this particular color to a more closest matching one so that it can produce a lesser resolution or a higher resolution with the closest matching colors okay all right so these are just file formats for images for macintosh okay the most commonly used format in mac is bict okay so um i don't think i need to go in details with that Okay, so with PICT file, both bitmaps and vector drawn graphics can reside side by side. So if you have a Mac computer, okay, there is a file called a PICT file which can be used inside your computer. Okay, right, so Windows format um, or Windows computer, okay, you can use BMP. All right, BMP is a type of image that can be used inside Windows, all right, or TIFF or IFF or even PCX. All right but okay the most commonly used file format across cross-platform format why cross-platform because it can be used anywhere inside Mac inside PCs inside other OS it doesn't matter okay so that's why cross-platform format are the most um, commonly used everywhere okay that's why you are most familiar with JPEG with GIF with PNG so these type of um, formats are commonly used formats on the web because when we download images, usually the image that we find, the file extension will either be in JPEG or PNG, okay? Um, depending on the software that you use, the type of image um, will have different file extension. So if you create um, images as a PDF file, then of course it will have an Adobe PDF format. So if you use Photoshop, okay, then that image will have a .psd format. If you use Illustrator, then it will have .ai format. So the format will depend on the different applications that you use, okay? So if you do AutoCAD drawings, then also it will have another format, such as IGS or IGES, okay? So um, I guess um, that's it for today, okay? And... Um, yeah, so I'm hoping that all of you are able to understand what I was explaining. And I'll see you in our next online class. Bye, guys.